Okay, record is on, Pastor. Hello, it's Pastor Larson, Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida. And we're coming to you by way of Zoom and recording whenever you want to watch it. Some of you on Sunday morning at 10, and we welcome you to our Bible study, which we call the Sunday morning Bible study. It used to occur in the upper room, that is, in the upstairs conference room. We hope and we do pray that we'll be back there soon, uh, but we'll leave that to the Lord. You're invited to worship with us on Sunday morning at 830 and 1030, or you can watch it online. So everything is taken care of. Uh, shall we get started with the Bible study? Who is Jesus is the question before us. And that's a question everyone ought to be able to answer. Everyone ought to know who he is. It's a second thing to believe in him. To... Last time we began looking at a very important question. Who is Jesus? By considering what the unbelievers said to Jesus. If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. In other words, how did Jesus show himself to be the Messiah, the Savior? Well, starting this time, we're going to look at the mountain, a veritable mountain of evidence, which answers that question. Three parts. Number one, the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy. There are over 37 of them. Number two, the New Testament witness to Jesus Christ. And that again is the word of God. And finally, the public miracles of Jesus, that is his works. Our aim is that the Lord will use his word to give us more confidence in our faith. So that's a worthy goal. I hope you would all agree with that. And I want you to join with, you, with us in heart and in mind and with your faith focused on Jesus. Who is Jesus? To answer that identity question, Jesus had but two answers for those who doubted. Number one, my words. My words. And the people he was talking to did not believe his word here in John chapter 5 and again later on. And then my works my works, which the Father has sent me to do. And we're going to define what we mean by Jesus' works uh, by and by here. So that's all we have before us to answer the question, who is Jesus? His words and his works. And when we talk about Jesus' words, we're also reaching back into the Old Testament, which pointed to him, which prophesied his coming. And those Old Testament witnesses also said, this is what he is going to do, his works. So what were his words? His teaching. Um, a year ago or so, we were studying the parables of Jesus and his sermons. We haven't studied those. And there are other witnesses to the truth about Jesus as the believers began to say things about him that they had learned to know. And what were his works? Can you name the works of Jesus? Miracles. Miracles. Blessings. I hadn't thought of that one. Yeah. What other works of Jesus? Hmm. Preaching. Yes, his preaching. That would be a work as well as the word, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What other works did Jesus do? Think of them not as something he did with his hands or with his mouth, but things that happened to him that was part of his experiences. Oh, his, ba his baptism? His baptism. Go on. Meeting um, when he was up on the mountain with on the uh, mountain. you mean you're thinking of the transfiguration, right? 
good, good. His, Other... his, his time in the desert um, when he was uh, fasting. Tempted, tempted yeah. by the devil. Mm -hmm. would, would you say his death? Yes. Yeah. That's part of the works of Jesus. It was passive. <laughs> but yeah. it wasn't totally passive because he gave up his spirit. Mm. All right. Here are the answers to your question. Uh, the miracles and the signs, they are combined together. You know that John calls them signs. He doesn't use the word miracles. And the other gospel writers, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they use the word miracle or works. And then the wonders that he did, which is part of the same thing, you didn't think of his obedience, which is perfect, but that's mm -hmm. part of his works. He did righteousness for us and all his good deeds are awarded to us that's something you don't think about very much is obedience hmm. you mentioned the temptation the transfiguration thank you joanne and his death the crucifixion and then the resurrection is part of jesus works and it's both that he rose from the dead and that the father raised him yes, the you. works of the trinity are not easily divided and then his ascension. Okay. All right. So answer the identity question. Who is Jesus? I want you to give a short summary of the person in life of Jesus. Now think of that person that sat down with you that I imagined with you last week. And the person who does not have faith in Jesus, but knows that you do that you're a follower, that you're a worshiper, that you pray, and so forth. And that person finally had the courage to ask you, tell me, who is Jesus? Can you give me a, a short summary of, of who he was, was and what his life was like? How would you sum it up in a very short sentence or two or three? Alexa, stop. How would you s summarize the life of Jesus? Well, I guess you could say he was born. He was born of a human being, um, uh, Mary, and he uh, lived on this earth with a family. He uh, uh, grew up until about the age of 33 for three years. He then proceeded to to teach and preach about his father in heaven and the life um, and his life. And then he uh, followed and um, followed his father's will to mm -hmm. be crucified for our sins, died and was crucified for our sins. Yeah. That's Very good. Weird. You want to go on? You can finish that paragraph. Oh, of course. And then he, he uh, the resurrection, of course, which was the most important part. And, uh, and he did that for us. Yes. Uh, that was the most important thing for the forgiveness of sins and for eternal life um, with him. Good. And then, and then what? 40 days later? Fifth. Oh, 40 days later, yes. Uh, ascended into heaven. Okay. To sit with his father. All right. In heaven. And then, I, I, guess I, I guess I'm thinking, you know, if this person didn't know much about Jesus when I mentioned uh, Mary to begin with, I don't think I don't think I'd even go into the virgin birth to start with because you I, might not. It's a it depends and uh, it and depends it, on the individual. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, one more thing we need to add. Um. Oh, oh, I needed it. You you I, left off with the ascension. Um. The resurrection and ascension and he, he gives us eternal life if we believe in him yes he left the holy spirit yes he did he promised it and, and on the 50th day after easter it, uh, the holy spirit was given and all his fullness well i'm teasing you because i have an answer and and uh, judy you did a very good job of reading of reading the apostles creed okay uh, what, did we say that it was he, it was pre predestined in the Old Testament? It was predicted like that? that all these things would would happen. They would come to pass. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, 
Now look at the summary that Judy, Judy gave. <laughs> uh, you might have left off at the beginning sure. that he is God's son. Yes. But yeah. it, you said everything else in the creed. I had to, I had to push you to the, the last one to come to judge the living and the dead. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. But if you do not know what else to say and you want to witness, I've told you this before, just say the creed. But don't say it in a sing-song way, the way the kids learned to do it in, in fourth grade or something like that when they were in Sunday school. You, you tell the story, okay? But this is your outline. You can fill in the blanks as much as you want to and as much as the receiver of your witness can have at that time. And that's a matter of judgment and prayer. And I can't tell you how to do that because everyone is different. And you can, right. but you can do that. And it's all there in your head and your heart. You believe this. And that's a short summary of the person and life of Jesus. Now, I'm not going to belabor it anymore, except to say there it is for you. Not the first article. That's another story. And the third article, the Holy Spirit, Holy Christian Church, the community, that's another long story. That's a lot of doctrine. I love it, you know. So let's go on with the person in life of Jesus. How is Jesus to answer this demand, if you are the Christ, tell us plainly? That question is going to hang over us um, the rest of the morning. Well, who are you? That's the person. And what are you doing? That's the works, tell us plainly. The Pharisees, as you remember, often challenged Jesus with questions. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And you know, they were trying to trap him. So you know the story, he got a coin, said, whose inscription is on it? And they said, Caesar's. And he said, well, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's. Now, they couldn't ask any more questions after that. They also wanted to know who sent you. When a prophet comes on the scene, those who receive a prophet want to know who sent you. And if you claim that God sent you, well, you've got a lot of proving to do. The Old Testament prophets weren't always received with joy, as you know. Sometimes, though, they had the word of the very word of God in their heart and coming from their mouth, they were refused and persecuted and killed. So <laughs> Jesus, as this prophet, he is a prophet, was killed partly because they did not receive him. And with what authority do you do this? Okay. Who is Jesus? Now, I have to say, and you have to realize that there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with wanting to know the answers to religious questions. And when someone asks you a question about your faith, it is good for you not to be defensive. For example, if you own a certain car, I don't care what brand it is, when someone asks you, why did you buy that car? You're not going to be defensive about it. You have no reason to be. You bought it. You chose it. You knew it was good for you. And it's working out very well for you. That's not a defensive answer. It's a statement of your confidence in that particular brand and that model. When someone wants to know about your faith, you simply say, well, this is what I believe. And you say it with, with the authority of confidence. Let me get off of that idea. But it's not wrong to question the identity of a man whom the word Messiah had become attached. It is, in, it is good that they asked, are you the Messiah or not? By asking, who are you and who sent you? Because if this was not the true Messiah, then we need to get to know that right away and put that person out of the picture. He's not going to appear in the Gospels. But this one was genuine. The disciples of John the Baptist asked the same question 
whether for themselves or for him. You can study the texts and you can, you can find out your answer to that, whether they doubted or whether John himself in jail facing death uh, <coughs> doubted. Are you the one who is to come or should we look for another? Hmm. Isn't that a pertinent question? You have questions about that question? No. no? It's probably a pretty normal question. Well, nobody wants to follow a false Christ. And there were other messiahs. But they weren't the true messiah. So who is Jesus? I want to say to you, go ahead. Pastor, are there a, accounts of what you say other messiahs, but they weren't? The, I mean, has someone put that, made an account of them? Well, I would go to Josephus, and I don't know for sure, but I know that Jesus said there will they other fa other messiah, false messiahs will come, and and claim to be. See, this was predicted, and you know that throughout the religious history of the world since him, there have been others claiming to be another prophet. I won't go into that branch of religion but others have claimed to be God's spokesman. They even appear on the scene today, but they may not call themselves the Messiah. Oh, about 20, maybe 30 years ago, there was a Reverend Jung Sung Moon in Korea, wasn't it? Who had a very large church. And at one point uh, was elevated pretty high. They, they thought well of him. I don't even know if he is still alive. And he performed those mass marriages. Oh, wow. Oh, I remember that. Many followed him. When you see a prophet on the television or hear a prophet on the radio who claims to be sent by God, listen to what is said and test everything against the Holy Scriptures that you have. That's your key. But those who did not believe around Jesus... They crowded around him and they kept asking him, use plain words. Their question implies doubt. Jesus, you're not being fair to us. You're not being clear. Use plain words. He could have answered them by simply saying, I am. There is a play on words there, intended. I am. And he says that about 14 times in the Gospels. I am the light. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the vine. And you can look them all up in your Bible by looking for I am. And if you have, an, if you have a digital Bible in your computer, it's even faster. You just put I am in quotes. And you look at all the I am's in the Old Testament, all the I am's in the New Testament, and you connect them together, and you've got yourself a pretty good Bible study. Maybe we'll do that sometime. It answers the question, who are you? I am. So their question implies doubt, and you and I occasionally will have a doubt about this or that. Is that really so? The word will tell you. And your confidence in the word is part of your faith. Your confidence in the word of God is something that God gives you. That's another long study. So tell us in plain words. Let's go on. Were there other proofs of Jesus' identity? Can you think of any? Well, at his baptism. Right. God said, this is my son. Exactly. Um, I think when, uh, even before... Christ was born, um, John the Baptist uh, leaped in Elizabeth's womb when Mary told. Oh, uh, that's, told a, that's a great one. I didn't think of that one, Judy. Yeah. John even acknowledged the, it was the uh, Christ before both of them were born. That is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Only a few <laughs> were witnesses of that. Yeah. Basically, Mary and Elizabeth, I think. Yes. Maybe a handmaiden, I'm not sure. Okay, good. 
Are there proofs of Jesus' identity that you can think of? Oh. Joanne when mentioned he, one earlier. When he was, oh, earlier? Oh, the ascension, or rather yeah. the- what? Transfiguration. Transfiguration. Mm -hmm. I mean, of, of Gabriel telling Mary. Okay. Yes. See, I, I don't need the slides, I have you. I have all of you. You are, you are, you're just anticipating. That's what we're going to do. We're going to list four or five of them, and there are many of them, starting with the prophecies in the Old Testament, that were pointers that were coming true. They were being fulfilled. I often think of being fulfilled as a, a, not just a glass. Let's take um, a, a, a vase or a vase, if you prefer, and it has a shape. That's the shape of the prophecies. So that when the prophecies come true, they fill up the vase according to the shape of the prophecy. Can you visualize that? I should have a vase here. <laughs> and that's what they do. They fill it up. They fulfill it. This picture. Sure. They're being fulfilled both in and through Jesus in his works and his word and in the things that happened to him. Many of them were connected with and predicted his works. For example, in Isaiah 35, there is this prediction, the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. Isn't that a marvelous prophecy? Isaiah 35. Well, do you remember? Yes, certainly you do. Uh, how the works of Jesus, he fulfilled those predictions. Through his, yeah, through his miracles. Here they are. In, uh, in John chapter 9 and in Matthew pa uh, past, uh, chapter 15. Uh, Judy, you often read first, so go to it. Okay. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. And great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. And they put them at his feet and he healed them. Thank mm. you. Now, what a there's, wonderful there's, day that had to be. Yeah. The deaf mute is not mentioned here. We'd have to look up in Mark uh, chapter uh, 7 to find mm. that, but it's there. And so these things in Isaiah 35 were literally fulfilled when Jesus fulfills the prophecies concerning him. And nobody else is doing these works. You get the impression that Jesus is the Son of God with power, anointed by the Holy Spirit, and able in his works of love and compassion to do the things that are necessary. To They both prove his identity and show his love for real people with real physical and mental problems and spiritual problems, let's add that. You any comments or questions about this? Mm -mm. I'd like to pause long enough. If I were in the classroom, I would be looking at your eyes to see <laughs> your faces to see if I there were quizzical looks. I, like I said before, I just think that had to be a marvelous day when all these things happened. Uh, Indeed. When you think about it. Yeah. So you study, you study the prophecies. And if you have a reference Bible with those little tiny letters that your eyes can hardly see anymore, uh, you can look up the references and go back to the Old Testament as you read the Gospels. You can look them all up. That's a good thing to have. Who is Jesus? You can look and more of the evidence for Jesus' identity in some of the prophecies which he fulfilled. I guess I just said that. Mm -hmm. For example, and in summary, what did Jesus tell the Emmaus disciples? 
on the day he rose from the dead. You remember that was the saddest Easter, the saddest Easter ever was these two disciples. And they say this, oh, sad and tear-filled uh, sentence of disappointment. And we thought he was the one to redeem all Israel. And now he was dead. Wow. They didn't know he had risen from the dead. And you know what happened? Remember what, it, what happened to them? Luke Their chapter, eyes were opened. We will, we'll get there. First, first we've got to have somebody comes alongside of them. It wasn't Jesus joins them yeah. on, on their way. There's suddenly oh, there's this man that they don't know. Why are you so and sad? Their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Their eyes were kept from that's passive voice, which means uh, somebody is holding back their recognizing him for a while until, mm -hmm. and this is going to be my point, finally he had listened to their sad tale of woe. <laughs> How can you have woe when Jesus is alive? <laughs> There's a lesson there. Luke 24, 25 to 27. Who else uh, would like to read? I can read. Please. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. What a Bible lesson that was. <laughs> we don't know how long it took. I'm going to tell you a short story. In southern Italy, when I was a lieutenant, I don't think I had made captain yet, I was asked to preach a sermon. I had not yet been to seminary, but I was asked to preach a sermon in the base chapel, and I chose this text. And on Saturday, I wanted to know what was it like to walk seven miles? That's the distance from Jerusalem to Emmaus, seven miles. I wonder well, how, how long, how, what would it feel like to walk? You know, we don't walk seven miles. So I was in pretty good condition. I was about 30 years old, I guess. And uh, so what I did is I, I walked seven miles and some people recognized me on the road and wanted to give me a ride. I said, no, I'm, I'm preparing for tomorrow. Huh? So I walked seven miles. And then on Sunday, when I preached the sermon, I could say, I know what it feels like to walk seven miles. <laughs> but I was not in sorrow. You see, I was in the knowledge that Jesus was the one who gave this Bible study to these two disciples who thought he was dead. But we know he is alive. Dr. Oswald Hoffman preached a sermon way back then. Uh, in the title, the title of his sermon based on this text was Keep the Rumor Going. God is alive. You see, the problem with modern day disciples that don't believe in the resurrection is they have no Christ. He's only, he only died for their sins and never rose again. If, if you don't complete the resurrection, you have no Christ. He's a false Christ. All right. I don't go on with the story anymore, but you see, they were foolish not to believe all that the prophets had spoken concerning Jesus. That Jesus had to suffer these things and die. And that's how he entered into his glory. Yes. And then beginning with Moses, reaching all the way back to Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and in the Psalms, and in all the scriptures of the prophets, 
And he said, this referred to me. Now we don't know the names of, but we know one name and it's Cleopas. And the other disciple is not named. And some people used to think that the other disciple was one of the 12. But the reason it's not true is these two go back to Jerusalem to report that they had seen Jesus alive. You remember, he vanished from their sight after breaking bread with him. Well, when they go back, they greet the 11, not 12, Judas is gone. They greet the 11. So he, these two greet the 11 apostles. And that means that Cleopas' friend is not one of the 11. And of course, Cleopas is not one of the 11. I guess you didn't need to know that detail, but there it is in Luke 24. The whole point of my citing these two, these three verses is that Jesus is able to do a complete Bible study concerning the prophecies concerning himself. Now, you mentioned the transfiguration. I'm going to ask someone to read Matthew 17, 1 to 5. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them and a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. We have a lot there. We won't unpack it all. Um, Peter is always coming up with these things that, not, you know, if you're a teacher, if you ever taught a class, you always have somebody in the class like Peter who thinks he knows all the answers and, and says things that have nothing to do with the subject. Well, that's all right. And you have patience. As Jesus had a lot of patience with Peter. It's good. We're going to make booths or tents up here and we're going to stay here. No, no, Peter. <laughs> Not now. We have to come down from the mountain to the plain. But we have the voice from heaven. This is my beloved son. Another way to translate that is, this is my son, my beloved. They both work. They're both correct. Mm -hmm. And God the Father is well pleased with his son. And then the directive, listen to him. If you don't do anything else, if you're a new believer in Jesus Christ, if you don't do anything else, sit down and read the four Gospels and just listen to what Jesus says. If you have a, uh, all the words of Jesus printed in red Bible, well, that'll make it very easy for your eyes to find. If you don't, you can still find the quotations, what Jesus said. Listen to him. You have the mark of, of God, the Father's approval on his son. You know, the transfiguration is a marvelous thing that Jesus is going to be transfigured, but this is a prefiguration of his glory when he is raised from the dead and when we will see him when we are ushered into his presence. Uh, will we need sunglasses? The brightness? I, I don't know. I don't think sunglasses will be issued. <laughs> uh, I, I have no, no, no uh, word on that. Well, let's talk about this transfiguration. There's one of the artists uh, configuration or uh, imagination of what it looked like. There's Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Of course, he's the one that the artist pictures in white. 
And there on the ground. James and John. Yeah, they're trying to hide their their face from the glory, the brightness. I don't think an artist can fully picture the scene, but there's an attempt on the high mountain. Well, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 to 19, Peter remembers, this is really important, Peter writes about that confirmation that he and James and John received at the Transfiguration. By now, when Peter is writing his second letter, he finally gets it. He finally has the Holy Spirit. He has a lot more humility and sense that he had uh, when he was with Jesus in person. But he remembers the prophecies and the fulfillments, and he realizes that he's got something, and James and John have it as well, that the, other, the others didn't have. And this is what it was. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were, what? Eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And there you have the quote. How could he forget it? We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have, and this is my point in verse 19, we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. The one I remember is we have the word made more sure. <clears throat> we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. The dark place is this world and Jesus is the light of the world. That's how I'll interpret that last phrase. But my main point is underlined in verse 19. We have the prophetic word made more sure. Now, do you see the connection that I've made between the transfiguration and this word from Second Peter. Let me summarize it. The word may more fully confirmed. I want to ask you, why was this evidence of Jesus' identity so important to Peter and then therefore to us? Well, because he said Peter was the rock and the church would be built on him and Peter was still not sure. Let, let me please make a gentle correction, Chris. Okay. <laughs> uh, when there's two words there and they're both true in the Latin and in the Greek, uh, the writings of uh, uh, people that came after Jesus uh, about this, when speaking of Peter's confession, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That was the confession. Well, I tell you, Peter, you are Cephas, meaning rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. Not upon Peter, oh. but upon his confession. And that's the error uh, that the Roman church made in the first few centuries. And it, that error has, has been with them ever since. That the rock... Uh, it was Jesus himself and the confession that he is the Christ, the Messiah. That's what we're trying to show in this Bible study. That yeah. he is the one that the prophecies said would come. And he has come. And who is he? His person is, he is the Christ, the son of the living God. That's what Peter said. Now, we're not going to what Peter said after that. That's another story because Peter was wrong and had to be corrected. But here, the confession of Jesus being the Messiah, the Son of the living God, is the rock on which the church is built. If he is not that, then, then the church has been built on shifting sand. 
Wow, that is fascinating. I'm so glad to hear this today because I was not sure. All right, you, you we have to. It's the answer is hidden in the last two letters of the two words for Peter's name and uh, what would be his confession. One is, is is in the masculine, which is the Peter, and the other is in the feminine, which has to do with the confession. I believe I have that correct. And you have to see that. Uh, otherwise, when you use the word this as a pronoun, you have to know, well, upon this, I will build my church. He wow. uses Peter's name as kind of a memory aid on a, a mnemonic, I guess. But it comes from Peter, and Peter has been given that faith. Mm -hmm. And... A, a limited amount of knowledge. So then that's important to us, isn't it? As you just evidenced. Yes. And what did Peter mean by the prophetic word? What do you think? If you don't know. You know, when we think about these fishermen that Jesus picked out to go with him, he, it, 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 you might say, well, what would they know? see, a good Jew would still be in the synagogue on the Sabbath and hear the word. And they would hear the Old Testament read. And they would learn. They would be taught at an early age. No, they didn't have Hebrew school like they have today in the Hebrew grade schools. But they had the equivalent, probably taught in the homes. Do you know that from uh, Deuteronomy 6? Uh, I believe it is, that, that they were required, the fathers were required to teach their children. No catechism class on Saturday morning or Sunday afternoon. No, the catechism class, such as it was, uh, was taught by dad. Right. He had the knowledge because he had been taught by his <laughs> father and granddad, and they passed, on, they passed on to generation after generation. That was God's rule for the family. I wish it were so today. <laughs> Families are not that close. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to take that tangent. It is so sad. So it's, it's important that Peter knew the prophetic word, even though he was a poor, ignorant fisherman. No, he wasn't ignorant. <clears throat> That's how he knew the prophecies. And perhaps Jesus in his other teachings that are not recorded, I, I don't know taught them those things. I don't have any evidence for that. Then how did the transfiguration give Peter, James, and John confirmation of Jesus' identity? I think the answer is obvious. Yeah. The voice born from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. I'm looking at the, the time here. I'm trying to keep within a reasonable oh. time. That's so fast. Yes. And I'm not worried about how much we cover. You know, it's kind of like the handouts and we only got three questions answered, but that's okay. I'm going to give you some homework to do. Ooh, okay. And uh, I want you to have some fun with it if you like. And you know that because you have asked for it, I've been sending you the slides that we cover in the Saturday morning uh, 10 o'clock study that we're doing now. So when I send you the slides, I will send you this, and you see the blanks, and you're going to look up Isaiah 714, and you're going to look up Matthew 1, and, okay. and you're going to, you know, use your hand to hold the pages together in between, and you're going to look with your eye at the, at the one passage in 714, and then you're going to look at Matthew 1, and you can say, look, those are, they go together, and you write, if you want, you write on the blank or just with your mind what was the prophecy fulfilled would you like to do that you can i can't do it now it take too much time if we were in class i think we would do uh flipping the bible pages back and forth and this would take oh half an hour yeah All right now i i'm thinking oh, this is a good place to stop peek ahead to oh, i can peek ahead this way Yes, yeah, so this is kind of a, 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 the same thing. So these aren't 
literally. They're, they're kind of a picture. You look up the first prophecy in Genesis 3.15 and see that the Messiah will crush the head of the serpent. And uh, if, you've, if your eyes are really good, you'll be able to realize that when uh, uh, Jesus was crucified and rose from the dead, that he was fulfilling Genesis 3.15. Only the eyes of faith can see that. And then you go on to the next prophecy, Old Testament, New Testament, Old Testament. And you go through all the fulfilled prophecies lined up as evidence. Did I tell you before, I think I had 37 of them. So you, by doing this, you get another way to answer the question, who is Jesus? From his word, from his works, because he fulfilled these things. More than 40, no, I know it was more than 37, Old Testament prophecies. And these prophecies, uh, we're going to go into that next time. Is that all right if I hold that for next time? And I'm yes. looking at the time here. It's uh, 10.59 on my watch. And that means that we've been going for, oh, I think the answer is long enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the... Uh, they used to say when you sat down to a lecture that your mind can only in, uh, absorb what your, your seat can endure. <laughs> All right. Uh, I really enjoy being with you. Uh, let us pray about what we've had here this morning. Lord God. Here we have your son, Jesus Christ. Uh, it is so good. It is so good to have those things and to know that you are the one who sent your son into the world to redeem us sinners so that we might have faith in him and believe and be saved. That is to have our sins removed and to have the promise of the glories of heaven waiting for us. Until then, please fulfill in us the things that you want for us, including love for one another as you have loved us. And let us seek ways every day to love the people around us and the people we would like to have around us and to give to them what we have, the knowledge of uh, Jesus Christ, your son, and our faith in him. We thank you for the people who gather now and later on and ask you to bless them through the solid word of yours that is able to make us wise into salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And it is in his name that we pray and ask everyone to agree by saying amen. 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 Bye-bye <coughs> till next time. <laughs>